Just a few days ago, the United States Federal Reserve dumped nearly $1.5 trillion into short-term markets, which spawned many questions online like, why aren't we giving this money to the sick instead? And why aren't we paying off student loan debt instead? I mean, I get it, right? Over a trillion dollars is uh, a ton of money. But it isn't like the Fed has a huge gold reserve and they're selectively choosing who to give it to, right? What we just witnessed is known as quantitative easing, and uh, it's a dirty trick used by central banks to stimulate the economy. Though, that isn't what always happens. I want to break this down as far as I can to help even the most financially illiterate of you grasp what's going on in 2020. Stay with me. If you're sick of seeing that same Activate Windows watermark over and over, snag an OEM license from SCD Key. You'll have a fully activated OS in seconds and you can kiss that watermark goodbye. And be sure to use menu offer code GSL for that sweet discount. So let's start with a very basic definition of quantitative easing. It's an unconventional influx of money from central banks into local markets via asset purchases. Usually things like bonds and more recently in Japan's case especially, ETFs. Central banks are government institutions set up to manage the supply of money in a given market. The Central Bank of the United States, for example, is the Federal Reserve, or the Fed, and the Central Bank of Canada is, well, the Bank of Canada. Japan's is the Bank of Japan. They control prevailing interest rates, money supplies, and a long list of commercial bank requirements. Now, when you hear of the Fed lowering interest rates, what they're trying to do is stimulate growth by making money cheaper to borrow. We all prefer lower interest rates because it means we're paying less overall on top of principal to the lending institution. It's the cost of borrowing money. That's what interest is. Usually, a bank or a credit union is the person or the, the entity that will give you the loan. For example, a $20,000 five-year auto loan with a 5% interest rate comes out to roughly $377 per month that you would either pay to the bank or credit union, and that comes out to $22,645 in total payback, which means you're giving, in essence, $2,645 to the lender over five years to borrow the 20 grand. This ignores the time value of money to an extent, but you know what I'm trying to get at here, right? You're paying that extra on top of the 20 grand you initially borrowed. It's really not a bad gig. Auto loans typically aren't terrible, but if the same load had, say, a 10% interest rate, you'd be paying $425 per month, so almost 50 bucks more a month, and $25,496 overall, so nearly $5,500 to borrow the same amount of money. Interest rates, along with other factors, provide context clues regarding economic health. Believe it or not, some countries have prevailing negative interest rates, which I didn't even know existed until I wrote this script. Japan, Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, they're all examples, right? This means that instead of banks paying you to hold and borrow your balances, you pay the banks to hold your money. This isn't always how it works, but in theory, on paper, that's what would happen. It's usually a very small amount if you do end up paying the bank, but it indicates that the country as a whole is generally risk averse and would be willing to pay a federally insured bank to safeguard funds instead of invest said funds. Anyway, back to our discussion. If a central bank determines that traditional means of stimulation are not cutting it, they may resort to more extreme methods, and quantitative easing, or QE, is one of those. So consider what just happened. The Fed pumped $1.5 trillion into short-term markets, which means they bought assets from commercial banks and other companies in an effort to stimulate growth. They essentially printed money and gave it to companies in exchange for assets that they'll eventually sell off or do something else with. But where does the money come from? I just said they printed the money, but it's not really that simple. And how does this sort of injection actually grow anything? First, the central bank doesn't, again, spend $1.5 trillion of its saved up dollar bills somewhere in a vault or something. That, that isn't how it works nowadays. The US dollar is a fiat currency, which means it isn't technically backed by anything. And it also means we can print it on demand. There's no standard that determines how much of it we should print, whereas prior to 1971, the US dollar was exchangeable for a fixed amount of gold, roughly $35 per ounce, with a few fluctuations around market crashes and war, but it meant that there was a certain amount of US dollars in circulation to correspond to the amount of gold that the Federal Reserve had on hand. It's because we use a fiat currency, though, that we're able to implement something as brash as QE. When it's announced, the Federal Reserve essentially prints money. Now, it isn't as simple as, as it sounds, probably, but at the end of the day, the Fed moves a few boxes around and ends up with $1.5 trillion more than it had a few minutes prior. And this is one of the reasons why you can't simply say that the Fed could have paid off student loan debt instead. Because they're printing this money and giving it to banks, whereas banks manipulate money by essentially loaning out way more than they have at their 
you know, in their, in their facilities. Uh, the Fed is kind of doing the same thing in this case. And it really only works with corporations and, and more specifically banks because banks, again, do the exact same thing. But anyway, moving on, they do definitely devalue their own currency as a result of this printing. It's something known as inflation. It trickles down to the consumer at some point, resulting in a higher CPI and thus higher degree of inflation. CPI is a measure of inflation. Now let's tackle the growth phase. How the heck does giving money to banks that you just create out of thin air grow the economy? It's actually an interesting question. Actually, I'm going to put the word grow in quotation marks because uh, it doesn't always work out that way. You see, when the Fed creates money and uses it to buy government bonds and corporate assets, it suddenly places more money in the hands of commercial banks. And this is where, again, being a bank is important because of what banks do. It's the nature of how a bank works in a capitalistic society. Banks make money by, well, loaning it, actually loaning more than they have on hand. And the excess capital is supposed to persuade them to lower interest rates further to encourage more loans and offer unique financing terms to stimulate investment. Investment is important here. But and this is a big but. This entire process assumes that banks will use the capital wisely. And uh, we all know from the 08 financial crisis what happens when corporations are simply given money, whether it be through a bailout or asset purchase. We put a considerable degree of faith into these institutions, and uh, we hope that they utilize the funds in such a way that the economy as a whole would benefit. Japan tried this several times throughout the 2000s and ended up with an insane level of debt given its size and GDP, and after injecting trillions of yen into commercial banks and seeing little to no real uptick in market conditions, the country was backed into a corner and succumbed to negative interest rates. A point of no return, in a way. And I'm sure we could have all seen this coming because, Captain Hindsight, when we gave big business the bailout in 08, many of the uh, corporate fat cats ended up giving themselves hefty bonuses with that money sent directly from the government, courtesy of you and me, taxpayers. That's what happens. But look, this is why so many economists are afraid of negative interest rates here in the States, right? Policies that are largely unproven in the long term elsewhere in Europe and such uncertainty for a country our size could spell irreversible damage to a country already buried in a pretty substantial amount of debt. Now look, when it comes to economics, especially when I'm trying to grasp how something works, I always try to look at things from a micro perspective first. What would the individual do? It tends to weed out useless politics and bias and force individuals to consider things for themselves. Consider the following. Times are tough. You're barely earning enough from work every month to pay for your mortgage. And because of this, you can't go out on weekends and enjoy a movie or a fancy dinner with your significant other. Let's assume this is a case for most middle class workers. So local businesses are suffering as a result and the economic outlook of your city is not very favorable. Now in comes the government. We all love when this happens, right? Offers to simply give you money. Call it a stimulus, no strings attached. It's literally a check for 500 bucks. What would you do with it? In fact, the US government did something very similar to this, believe it or not, in 2008 for the 07 tax season. When market conditions were grim and an impending recession loomed, we all kind of knew it was coming, we just didn't know how extreme it was gonna be. We thought it'd be very small. In fact, some people were still very bullish right before all of this happened. What would eventually become the financial and housing crisis? Mind you, government stepped in and issued tax rebates for individuals and families who met certain criteria. Now, most middle and low income legal residents receive between 300 and 1200 US dollars in rebates through direct deposits or physical checks. The intent was for this surplus of money, funds essentially, to stimulate a dying economy. More money in accounts should make people spend more. Right? And yet several studies point out that only around a third of the tax rebate was actually spent per household, meaning consumers largely chose to save the funds instead, which is, I mean, actually pretty smart on a consumer level. If you're barely making enough to pay your mortgage each month, having a nice cushion of funds in your accounts is a good thing. That's, that's good finance. There are several conflicting studies, mind you, regarding this approach by the Bush administration, but I want to kind of just put all that aside for a second, right? And, and I want you to ask yourself what you do in this scenario. Would you save or would you spend? And if you do a little bit of both, tell me how much you would try to save of the amount that you were supposed to get. You know, I think it maxes out at 1200 bucks. If you have two dependents, then it would be you plus your spouse. So if you're filing jointly, 600 bucks plus 300 per child. So 1200 in total. If you have four kids, you're only getting tax credit for two of them. That, that's pretty conventional actually. But anyway, take that train of thought, all right? That realm, how much would you save or spend? 
Put that into the realm of business now. Say you own a commercial bank. It doesn't have to be a big bank, right? You make money by giving out loans. However, interest rates are terribly low at the moment and your income has been steadily declining for years despite an influx of loan applications. There just aren't enough loans being given out to make up for the drop in the interest rate. If a central bank suddenly bought millions of dollars worth of assets from you in order to increase your liquidity, let's say they bought a bunch of notes from you, what would you do with the excess capital? Would you loan it out? Keep in mind, interest rates are the lowest they've been in years. And from a consumer side of things, this is, this is supposed to be a good thing, right? Low interest rates means people are gonna go out and take loans, start small businesses, buy houses, whatever. But if the economy is apprehensive, people generally behave in a risk averse fashion. Maybe loans aren't such a good idea right now because I'm actually living paycheck to paycheck, which majority of Americans are, believe it or not. This mentality, of course, impacts banks directly. And if they're picking up on this, you might be reluctant to loan this new capital out. Maybe you'll just store that money from the government for a while. You never know, right? I mean, you never know what could happen. The markets could crash tomorrow. This is the setting of the world stage at the moment, and it's being compounded by various health crises and tanking oil prices, thanks to Saudi and Russian disagreements, which, are we really surprised? What we're left with is a very unique combination of factors we've never seen before, and it's why no one really knows what'll happen next. I know plenty of people who are expecting the market to crash soon, and I know plenty of people who say, well, this was the crash, it'll rebound now. I'm not a fortune teller, I can't tell you what's gonna happen. Consider liking, subscribing, and I'll catch you in the next one. My name's Greg, thanks for learning with me.